In this video, we'll take a look at work motivation theories. We'll start with an overview of how these theories have evolved over the years. Then we'll briefly examine two early theories and see what impact they have today on our thinking about motivation. In a future video, we'll consider other, more recent theories. Now, we all know that motivation matters, of course. It's hard to get anything done if motivation is low. But on the other hand, if we've been truly motivated by something, we can get lost in our work for hours at a time. Psychologists have been studying this for a long time, and the theories used to explain motivation have changed over the years, sometimes in dramatic ways. So let's take a look. One way to classify the theories of motivation is based on the way they view the role of human thought. In other words, how important are the worker's thoughts and judgments for determining their motivation, and thus their level of performance? Historically, the answer was not at all. We can refer to these as thought-free theories. Now, this doesn't mean that these theories argued that thought doesn't happen, simply that cognition is not an important determinant of motivation. These theories emerged in the 1940s and 1950s and focused upon either universal needs or systems of reinforcement as the drivers of behavior. In the first case, a person's behavior is driven by the needs that are currently unmet, and in the other, the person does whatever results in a pleasurable outcome. Note that neither of these ways of thinking about motivation needs a thinking human to operate. In a moment, we'll consider two of these thought-free theories. But first, let's take a look at the other kinds of theories that we'll get to later on. Somewhat more recent are what I am calling rational theories. In these theories, human judgment is important. People evaluate their environment, and based on what they see, they make decisions about how to behave. Two key assumptions with these theories is that first, people operate in their own economic self-interest. So they are driven by economic thought. It is assumed that a person will always act in a way that maximizes the rewards that they seek. And second, People are able to make rational, almost mathematical judgments about how their environment is structured. So while thought is important, unlike the other theories that we talked about just a second ago, it is assumed to be unbiased and actually rather unemotional. The third group of more modern theories, what I call here responsive theories, also view thought and judgment as important. But these theories are less reliant on the assumption that thought is completely rational. In these theories, the person acts with a particular intention in mind and responds to whatever feedback the environment provides about their abilities and their performance. For the rest of this particular video, we will focus just on the thought-free theories. We'll look at two of them. So let's do that. Let's start with one that many of you are probably familiar with. This is Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. In this theory, there is a hierarchy of five needs, usually displayed as a pyramid. At the bottom are the more basic, life-sustaining needs, such as physiological needs and safety needs. As these lower needs are met, a person moves up to start working on satisfying the next higher need. So if I have my physiological needs met, for example, I can then focus on my safety needs. If my safety needs are met, I can then focus on my love and belonging needs. Also, if a lower order need was no longer met, you would have to work on that until it was satisfied again before you could then focus on a higher order need again. So if I was focusing on my esteem needs, and for some reason my love and belonging needs were no longer being met, I would have to stop working on my esteem need until I could re-satisfy those love and belonging needs. After that, I could go back to working on the esteem needs. At the pinnacle are the self-actualization needs, which can only be met once all the other needs have been satisfied. Maslow actually thought that very few people ever truly satisfied these needs. There are actually some problems here, so can you think of any? Well, first, note that while this model is internal, that is, the needs come from within the person, it is more or less unconscious and automatic which makes sense since we put it under the heading of thought-free theories. You don't have to spend much time thinking about whether you are hungry or safe, or even whether you feel loved or confident in your abilities. 
Most psychologists, or managers for that matter, would probably have trouble with the notion that an employee's level of motivation and their behavior had nothing to do with their thoughts, judgments, or even emotions. Second, consider this. Have you ever worked on a task, maybe a paper or a project, maybe you were playing a musical instrument or practicing a sport, where you kept working on that task even past the point of being hungry or thirsty? That's a situation where you're ignoring a lower order need to keep pursuing a higher order one. According to Maslow's hierarchy, that shouldn't happen. Now, Maslow's ideas are still kicking around, and the average person probably is more familiar with this hierarchy than just about any other motivation theory out there. But at this point, it's of more historical interest than it is an actually viable theory. In other words, don't put too much stock in Maslow's hierarchy, or any need-based theory for that matter. They just aren't a complete, accurate reflection of human motivation as we understand them today. The other example of a thought-free theory that we'll look at is reinforcement theory. This is very different from need theories like Maslow's, although it emerged at roughly the same time. Why? Well, reinforcement theory emerged out of behaviorism, which links behavior to the consequences of that behavior. So this theory is closely related to the operant conditioning ideas of B.F. Skinner and others. As such, while need theories like Maslow's are internal, reinforcement theories are external. Behavior comes from the system of rewards and punishments in the environment. This is actually a very alluring idea for managers because it means that they might be able to improve motivation of workers just by structuring the reward environment properly. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say my department chair says that he'll give me a thousand dollar bonus if I serve as the advisor to five master's student theses this year. But if I don't do this, there's no bonus. So this is known as a contingent reward because the reward he's offering is contingent on a certain behavior on my part. If I engage in that behavior, I get the reward. If I don't engage in that behavior, no bonus. Presumably, I would be more likely to advise those five theses with this contingent reward than if it weren't there, right? It's pretty simple. It's actually so simple that even Homer Simpson appears to know this. In one episode, he was hired to manage a team of computer programmers, and when asked about his job by Marge at some point, he told Marge, Mr. Scorpio says productivity is up 2%, and it's all because of my motivational techniques like donuts and the possibility of more donuts to come. And again, this is a thought-free theory. Skinner famously argued that cognitions were unimportant byproducts that weren't worth studying. In fact, he thought they couldn't be studied. No one debates that, at least in some circumstances, reward structures can improve motivation. So reinforcement is still an important component of many modern theories of motivation. However, like the need theories, reinforcement theory in its purest form has some problems. What do you think they might be? Well, first of all, most jobs are too complex to easily implement consistent reward structures. Those kinds of simple, repetitive jobs, like piecework and manufacturing, are quickly disappearing due to automation and more team-based approaches. Also, we now do think that human judgment plays an important role. What if I decide that those five theses would amount to an awful lot of work and it's not worth the thousand dollar bonus? Or what if I don't care about making more money in the first place? Wouldn't those things affect my motivation level? It seems reasonable that they would. Any theory that doesn't allow for active reasoning on the part of the worker we now think of as being pretty incomplete. And so while we may use reinforcement as a component of a modern theory of motivation, reinforcement by itself is not the whole picture. That concludes this video on thought-free theories of motivation. Thanks for watching.